This podcast is sponsored by eBay Canada. eBay Canada is here to help. They've been supporting Canadian small business retailers for 25 years and have recently launched their up and running program to meet an urgent need to get businesses online today. New business sellers can get a free e-commerce store for 90 days when they visit ebay.ca slash up and running. Offer open until August the 22nd. Welcome to Canada's podcast, the number one podcast for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. Hi, this is Angela Fay from Canada's podcast on this Canada Day. Very excited to be uh, celebrating and spending some time with Sarah uh, and as we celebrate our national holiday as well. So I would like to just quickly introduce Sarah Safari from CE Owned. Now, one fun tidbit of information is that CE, uh, Sarah is actually stuck in Colombia right now. So we're a little, we're so close because our hometowns are only 30 kilometers away between Nanaimo and Vancouver, but we are a world apart right now. We are. So, uh, yeah, tell me a little bit about you, Sarah. Uh, tell me, share, share a bit of your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, so, um, I mean, in terms of travel, yes, I'm, I'm stuck in Colombia. <laughs> I have been and I will be for another few months. So there's absolutely no flights until September internationally. Wow. Um, so, so that's a thing. But in terms of my entrepreneurship, the journey, all that kind of stuff, it started in Vancouver, Canada about three years ago um, when I ended up opening a gym after you know having a one month trip in South America. I was in Panama and I saw a couple in Panama and they were working online. They were you know going on an excursion shortly after and they were making money doing all that at the same time and I was just I was shocked. It was the first time I had ever seen in my life the possibility of being able to travel, being able to have that freedom, and at the same time, being able to make a living. Um, and so I remember going home from that trip and just researching and researching, trying to figure out how I could do the same, because at the time I was using um, personal training as my side hustle. And so I, I ended up, at that time, once I got back, hiring a coach, um, moving out of my parents' house, leaving my nine to five, um, and, and just opening a gym in Vancouver all at the same time. So that's kind of where I started. Um, that's where I started working with personal trainers. And eventually through that development, I was able to, um, start CEO owned last year. And just give me a snapshot of what CE owned is today. Yes. So we're a coaching and consulting company. So what we do is we essentially help coaches build their online business in two ways. So either if they're starting from zero, they just have no idea how to get started, how to um, essentially use the blueprint to create a business and build it to six figures. We help them step-by-step step build that business so that they can be successful, they can get the right clients and be able to do that in a step-by-step -step manner. Now, the second type of client we help is essentially someone who has already gotten some clients, they have some momentum, but they don't know how to scale. They don't know how to mm. grow even bigger and what they need is systems that are gonna allow them, systems and a team that is gonna allow them to be able to do that. Well, and we talked a little bit about your business model as well. Um, and something that I thought was really intriguing when we first met was the discussion about the golden handcuffs. Could you just give me a snapshot on what that means for you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so for me, um, what happened was, you know, I grew up in a family where we struggled a lot, right? So I um, immigrated to Canada when I was two years old. Um, and we were poor, like we didn't, we didn't do so well. My parents fought a lot about money, um, finances a bit was a big thing. So I just remember for me it was ingrained in my mindset that, you know, lack of money means lack of happiness. And that was a huge thing for me. And so I grew up with the desire to make a lot of money because I wanted to avoid, you know, those fights. I wanted to avoid sadness. I wanted to avoid all of that, that I kind of, you know, was exposed to growing up and, the only thing that I knew, the only way that I knew how to do that at the time was for me through school, through being either a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. 
And so that's why I originally end up doing a health science degree. I was going to either do physical therapy or law or, or go and be a doctor. I really didn't know, but I was just playing with those fields, honestly, mostly because it had merit, it had societal acceptance, and there was um, a wealth aspect to it, which was obviously appealing to me considering what I you know, wanted growing up. Um, and so that's, that was kind of what led me to have that desire. But once I had gotten back from Panama and I saw this opportunity to start my own business, I went from this desire to build the online business to ending up opening a gym because that's what my coach had told me to do at the time. Um, and instead of creating a life by design, I ended up just following someone else's blueprint of what success and wealth meant. Um, and as a result of that, what ended up happening was I was working in the gym from 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. till 10 p.m. And honestly, I was making what was to me at that time a lot of money. I was making $10,000 and then $20,000 months. And I just remember, I, I had told you this before as well, I just remember looking at the bank account and being like, whoa, like this is a lot of money. I had never seen that kind of money come in before. Um, I didn't really, I didn't even know how to feel about it or what to do about it, um, but I knew something was working. And um, at the same time, that was the first time that I had seen the discrepancy between having a lot of wealth and having that financial freedom and also feeling like I was in golden handcuffs because I was really unhappy. I felt like I didn't have any of the time freedom. I felt exhausted. I felt burnt out. And um, it became... It, got to a point where it was a drag for me to show up to work. So it was really weird. The thing that I had worked out for mm. my whole life, the thing that, you know, I fantasize, I imagine it being this glorious thing that would bring me essentially happiness um, was also the first time I felt actually the most miserable and the most locked down um, in my life because now I was locked down, not to a nine to five, but to um, essentially golden handcuffs that I had personally crafted for myself. Well, and that's interesting. And I, uh, I, I can't help but comment that, uh, you know, in this strange pandemic world that we're living in right now, that I think a lot of people are finding themselves in that position today, collectively, you know, it's one thing to go through that experience for yourself, Sarah, right? Where you're finding, okay, you were, you were, on this pathway that you had created and it was successful by societal's definition and yet you, you were depleted. And today, lots of people are going through this experience in many ways, but we're all experiencing it together in some ways. So um, I, I give you a lot of credit and a lot of, of privilege to have experienced it three years ago. So you're probably on the other side of, um, not, not suggesting that things aren't affecting you right now, but you're, you're clearly in a, in a place where you've got your life by design a little bit early. Would you consider your business a bit recession proof or pandemic proof? Yeah, um, I would. And I want to answer that question, but I also want to address what you, what you said about, you know, what had happened to me three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, there's a big difference between the people who end up being successful, whatever that means to them and the people who don't. And that ends up coming down to their perception and their idea of, is this experience, what I'm going through in this moment, is it serving me or is it hurting me? And if you can take every experience you have, whether it may seem um, on the outside as something maybe negative, and you can turn that around as something that's going to serve you so that you can turn that around and serve others down the line, well, then you're always, always going to, to be successful and you're always going to be able to help other people. And so now when I look back and I think of like, okay, you know, I ended up putting myself like voluntarily in these golden handcuffs and how does that serve me now is now that I know that I can now teach my students how to never have to go through that and instead be able to on purpose create a life of design because now I know they're going to come in and the first thing they're going to say is I need to make money I need to make money and I know that from like a soul heart level what that feels like and at the same time, I want them to create wealth, um, build a business of service with intention. 
rather than just yeah. go, go, go and say, whoa, like, <laughs> what have I, what have I created? Right. Um, so, so that's the, that's the biggest thing that I think I've noticed. What was the question that you had following that? And do you feel that your business is a bit recession proof or pandemic proof now? Yes. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, really happy to say that as well for a few reasons, right? Um, one is that it's, it's online. So I don't need to worry about going <laughs> to into work or going into my job. And so a lot of the time when, you know, when this happened, when it originally started happening in April, March, um, a lot of people stopped going to work. A lot of people stopped showing up. People could not, you know, be together. And so when something like a virus happened, you, you lose work, right? And so the fact that I'm online, the fact that I can essentially, if I need to isolate and still work is one of the factors. Um, and the second thing is just the nature of the work, right? So consulting and high ticket consulting and coaching in itself, you don't need 90% of the population. You don't need a vast mm. majority mm. of the niche you're working with. You need 0.0001% of that population to have a highly successful business. And no matter what, with regardless of whether you're in a recession or not, there will always be people ready and willing to buy a product that has the value of the service there. And if you have a great product, you have great positioning, and you have great marketing, and you are serving on the back end, you'll always be successful and you'll be recession proof. That's a great question. So something that we talked about um, in our, when we first met, and then uh, even now is you were, do, were doing fitness training first and now you're doing online coaching. And I remember you saying to me that you, you have a natural, uh, you know, attraction to teaching. Mm -hmm. yeah. How did you discover that about yourself? And is that maybe a piece of the magic that makes you know what you're doing successful yeah that's um <laughs> yeah that's a, that's a good question so um just like the teacher in me right yes. so yeah i think it was through trial and error it was honestly it was through trial and error it was through doing tests online it was through awareness it was through mm -hmm working with people. It was through diving in and seeing what I was good at and what lit me up and what got me excited and what gave me more energy versus depleted my energy. Right. And so I think where it also can, the lines can be blurred for a lot of teachers in particular, because I am one, is um, the line between the coach and the teacher. So although like I can coach and I'm very good at it, there is a big difference between the teacher and the coach. And so once you kind of start understanding, well, what is a teacher? What is a coach? Who is an influencer? And what are these differences? And then where do I line in that? Where do I lay in, in these lines? Then you can use that essentially what I like to call your superpower to shine and help other people. Because think about it, now that I know, oh, I'm a teacher. I'm really good at teaching. I know, okay, Sarah, you need to get on stages. You need to be doing things like podcasts you need to be writing and you're essentially doing things where you're teaching a larger group of people whereas the coach says I want to be there with you for every step of the process one-on-one -on -one, and I want to hold your hand I want to take you through it and both are completely necessary but all of us have a specific edge and a superpower in one area and once we can bring that to our conscious and awareness then we can start utilizing it to our best of our ability Brilliant. And, I, and I'm going to go back and just bring back your comment, which is you discovered it by trial and error, right? Like actually jumping in and doing it and figuring out what lights you up. I love that. I love that. Um, let's, uh, and so, I, and I love your, how did you come up with CEO owned? I know it seems so simple, yet it's just so punchy. I love it. Yes, yeah, and I, I do like it as well. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Honestly, it was, it was my business partner and I, um, we just came up with a bunch of names. We played with the word CEO. We use CEO owned as one. We asked a bunch of our friends. They all said by far that one's a winner. Um, and then we just decided to go for it. It's simple, catchy, and I think it gives a very quick description of what we do. Perfect. And I know, and so I, I've had a chance to kind of go through your website and I see that you have a, you know, a free mini business course, right? That people can, can download. And then you have a, the more coaching mentoring side, which is more the higher ticket price that, that guides people in a more accountability way. Did, did I 
catch that right? You got it. You got okay. It. And um, something I, I wanted to ask again is, do you, are you seeing any trends of your of the type of client? Um, I know you started off kind of teaching the, the fitness, um, you know, teachers, but you've kind of expanded now. Are they in any particular geography or any particular niche? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so let's expand on that a little bit. So initially okay. we did start out working with fitness people simply because, um, uh, my business partner, Hansika and I were both, um, background had in fitness. Um, and then as time went by, we started offering the service to other people because the same principles lie of marketing and sales across the board yes, for absolutely. certain businesses um, and so now we we work with you know anywhere from sexologist to mindset coach to relationship coach to the personal trainer to the life coach um, so in terms of that we do work with anyone who does have a service-based business we what mm -hmm. we do is just we just tweak certain techniques to be able to help them in their messaging because at the end of the day what's going to be the most important and it's going to attract either high paying clients versus low paying clients is going to be your messaging and how you position yourself in the marketplace to consistently attract the right people into your world. Because what happens is a lot of people have the, um, well, when they first start their business, they say, I just can't seem to get quality leads. So leads is just potential clients. So if they feel like they can't get potential clients, we need to take a look back and say, well, who are you speaking to? Do you genuinely understand your ideal client? Um, and if so, I want you to reiterate that back to me and go speak it to your ideal client and see if they resonate with it. Because if the answer to that is no, then chances are you aren't attracting your ideal client. Something that you said, uh, you touched on it a little bit earlier, uh, but we definitely talked about it before, was the effort that you're having to put in right now to shifting the mindset, you know, and it could be as simple as that positivity, but what is the, the extra bit of work in mindset that you're having to do today that, that uh, today? Yeah. Um, so I think there's a huge relationship between mindset, neuroscience, trauma, and awareness. And um, so what we do is a lot of neuroscience in combination with mindset. What I really mean by that is just teaching people to become aware of their subconscious thoughts. Because 95% of our thoughts are actions, the way we act, everything we do is from a subconscious level, right? And 5% of that is conscious. So if you and I, for example, we're going for a drive, we're having a good conversation, let's say we're going to the mall, we get to the mall, and once we get there, I ask you two questions. The first question is, what do we talk about during our drive to the mall? Um, and you can tell me verbatim, we talk about this, and we talk about this, and you can tell me all the details of that. I ask you the second question, and I say, how do we get there? No idea. I have no idea how we got there. So then the question becomes, who was driving the wheel during the time that we were having this conversation? And the answer to that is your subconscious mind. So, so mm. your subconscious mind, sometimes people will think it's an evil, it's the devil, but it, serve you. it serves you. It's there to help you. It's there to think, make things more practical so that you're not constantly and consistently right. thinking about it. The issue there lies when we get to a point where our subconscious mind thoughts behaviors and patterns that don't serve us become automatic in our lives and we let it control us and so what's happening now is now you're running under a program that's 95 percent of your day so what ends up happening is people wake up in the morning and they'll say i want to change i want a great life i want to be wealthy i want an amazing relationship i want to travel the world and then a week will go by, two weeks will go by, and they say, well, why am I getting these things? Why can't I do this? Why am I not getting myself there? And what's happening is, well, you're still working under 95% of those same subconscious programs that make up your personality, that make up who you are as a being, that make up how you think, that make up how you perceive the world. And so what we need to do is bring those subconscious thoughts, number one, to our conscious awareness and pick and choose which ones we want to keep and which ones we want mm. to. And so the, a basic idea in neuroscience is nerves that wire together, fire together. 
And so more like nerves that. that fire together. Yes. And so what happens is more nerves that wire together, they continue to fire together. They get stronger and stronger and stronger. And so what we need to do is over time, through strategies, through mental rehearsal, and through a number of other, other strategies that we use, you need to unwire and unfire those neural patterns that no longer serve you and replace them and rewire new ones that do serve you to the point where these new patterns, these new thoughts, these new behaviors become your subconscious program. And from, from like an image perspective, from your brain, you actually change the structure of your brain. And that's why we have no plasticity inside of our brain. And so when you start changing these patterns, your mm -hmm. brain physiologically changes. And people will start asking you, you know, what are you doing? Like, what is that? Are you doing on a new diet? Are you working out? Are you <laughs> doing a new job? And you're like, no, you know, I'm just doing the work. And the yes. work is being able to change that. Yes. And it's great. And you have that, or it's the glow factor, right? And you absolutely ooze that Sarah, by the way. So <laughs> I love just being in your presence. Um, I, I want to have a little bit of fun and let's, let's switch tax a little bit and go from Vancouver is hometown, but you know, tell me about Columbia and living there and what life is like right now. I mean, you're, you're the first person I've talked to that's stuck in a, in a, in another country. So let's, let's yes. share that yes yes let's talk about it um so <laughs> our quarantine started like near the end of march i had just gotten back from a business trip and it was starting to you know get serious sort of and so what i mean by that is i remember the government saying okay we're doing a weekend quarantine uh, we had no idea this would end up being like five months later we still in it and so it started with a weekend quarantine two three days he extended it for a week and a month and months and so as we know a lot of months have gone by but um from a day-to-day -day perspective what it's been like is um we have something called a cedula and what that is is like based on your id number so colombians they have like a colombian id if you're an extranjera so if you're um what we call gringas or gringos so like yeah. the you know yeah expats you um use your passport number and so they give you about two days maximum per week where you're allowed to walk in go to the grocery store get your groceries and walk out so you have to go straight there it has to be the closest grocery store to your house if, you know you get caught by police you're in trouble um you definitely wow. have to wear your tapabocas or your mask um and they they wash your ID, they wash your shoes, they spray you down, um, they take your temperature, and then wow. once you get in there, um, you know, you do your thing, you leave, they make you switch your mask, they take your temperature again, um, and then you're done and you can, you can go back in. So it's been pretty um, intense in that sense. Wow. Yeah. Um, it's definitely loosening up a little bit more, like some businesses have slowly opened. I would say overall, it's been good in terms of the number of cases. It's kept things like rel relatively stagnant or if it's increasing okay. just a little bit at a time. Um, but it's, it was an interesting experience. Um, again, like mm -hmm. I do think you have two choices in how you see the, um, you know, the situation at hand and you can just choose to allow it to help you grow or you can choose to be like damn I'm, you know i'm stuck in quarantine for a very long time so um yeah i think i think i, I at least i think i chose to you know work on it the right way and just pick up new hobbies continue to build the business stay motivated motivate others because it's a time where a lot of people were struggling in so many ways this podcast is sponsored by ebay canada ebay canada is powering canadian small businesses Go to ebay.ca slash up and running to open your online shop. And so obviously you, you're in the allow it to help you grow, you know, camp. So what, um, what have you done differently yourself in, in the last few months? Yes. Um, so, so I think that there's, you know, I think that, it's kind of like, this is kind of a funny analogy, but it's kind of like how alcohol amplifies the personality you already have. So if you're generally like a giddy, happy person, you drink, you're just going to be more giddy. You're going to be more happy. You're going to be more social, right? And so I think that quarantine is actually very similar. Yeah. In some ways. So I think that 
if you are a go-getter, a type A personality, very motivated, very ambitious, I think that quarantine amplifies that for you because in order for you to have any level of productive productivity, motivation, and consistency to keep going, especially when you're quarantined with people who maybe you may have not chosen to be quarantined with, when your external environment you can't control, the only thing that you can control is your internal environment. And for mm. me, I chose to do that every single morning and keep that as a genuine practice so that for me, what that looks like and what it did look like is um, long meditations in the morning, right? So I've been doing very long guided meditations for an hour in the morning, which for some people is crazy, but I built up to it, right? And so I make sure that every single morning I wake up and I get over myself before I start my day. Because if you can get over yourself, well, then there's nothing that's going to hold you back in your day. Because I think the only thing that ever holds us back is um, what's up here in our mind. And so I start with the meditation and I would uh, typically come down, have my coffee, do some journaling, do some gratitude, <clears throat> do um, a meditation course that I'm working. I picked up courses. Um, then I would typically start my day of work. I would definitely go to the grocery store the days that were my grocery days just to get some air. Um, and then I would finish my evening with either reading some kind of knowledge, building myself back up or getting creative and writing poetry or playing piano. I bought a keyboard <laughs> and so cool. I piano on YouTube, like just <laughs> doing those things to also keep some play and fun because um, you know, regardless, like, especially as a woman, like, and an entrepreneur woman, it's really easy for us to get really caught up in, in the type A, in the go-getter, in the ambition, and especially if you're inherently feel like you're fiery, right? Um, right. And so I think also we are inherently people, we just want to chill. We want to play. We want to be in our feminine. We want to have a good time. We want to laugh. And so I think that embracing that side of us um, feeds not only our personal life, but we show up in our business that much better. We show up for our students, yes. clients, our business that much better when we get to have that play time. We get to have, if you can't have social time, have a Skype date. If you can't, um, you know, go out with your friends, play some piano, watch us, listen to a song, just creativity in different forms so that you can just feed those different sides of you and you'll always show up better in your work for yourself so that you can show up better for everyone else as well. I love it. I would, I'm a little bit curious. Could you touch on um, the difference in uh, one of the unique things about Canada's podcast is that first of all, we're national. So we have hosts in, in each province and you know, we're, we're kind of touching on the different communities across Canada. And we'd like to bring that out in part of our, in, in, you know, showcasing the distinctiveness of Canadian, you know, entrepreneurialism, if you like. And so you are you born and raised in British Columbia, but you also are spending time in Colombia. So can you touch on the difference of the 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 cultures of the country, but also the culture of the of entrepreneurship that you have seen that's different between the two? Mm. Oh, that's very interesting. That's actually a tough question. So if I, I'll start with the entrepreneurship one. So it's I can definitely see it. So I'm very much exposed to prior to quarantine, because obviously yes. now like a little bit of social separation, but um, in normal days, um, I worked in an office where essentially you would get to connect, you would network with a mm. lot of entrepreneurs. Now, 90% of the entrepreneurs there were ex so like expats from the US and from Canada as well. Um, and so when you connect with them, in terms of cultural difference, there really isn't any because you're, you're working with um, Canadians who are doing different things, different businesses, but they have the same mindset of, as you of like wanting to do it from abroad and, and having the idea of, you know, having the travel bug and wanting to do all this different stuff. Um, but what I find is really cool is the mix and the connection between Colombians and Canadians. And so, ah. Yes. And so a lot of the time what happens is, you know, you'll meet Colombians in the office and you'll be able to connect with them. Maybe you can exchange business ideas with them. So often have I seen Colombians and Canadians partnering with one another and just 
being able to build businesses in different areas based on different areas of expertise um, together. And that's been a really beautiful thing, just seeing um, you know, the welcome on both ends of mm -hmm. each other's culture and, and working together as a team. And maybe sometimes it's areas in Spanish that a Canadian needs help with or, or vice versa with, you know, a Colombian who needs help with the English. Um, and there's always a lot of collaboration um, on both ends, which I thought was amazing. Absolutely. Do you think there's any particular uh, niche sector that uh, Colombia excels at? Uh, in business? In business? Honestly, it's all over the board. And it's, okay. it, if I were to give you uh, an example, it would totally be so biased based on my friends. So, right, uh, right, right. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and what, what inspires you right now, right? Your, your, uh, as far as reading or motivation, I know you said you do, you're doing a lot of meditation, but what are the things that are jumping out at you that are sticking to revive you, to get you inspired and motivated and energized? Yeah. Um, a few things. One is my students. Um, okay. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, our students, it's huge. I think nothing is more rewarding than watching your students win, watching your students grow. And, you know, my partner and I had built the business. And the first thing that we said was if we can help people get them from where we were to where we are, there's nothing for us more fulfilling than that. And so just being able to see our students go from ground zero to complete freedom, to being able to be either maybe at home with their kids if they want to be and, and be financially free or be able to quit their nine to five that they've hated for so long and be able to start traveling um, or, you know, just what, whatever it is that they wanted and seeing them being able to fulfill that and watching their growth and being a small part of that growth has been huge for us. Um, cool. And then the second thing like on a personal level for me is is growth internally right because mm -hmm. I think that as a teacher and with the desire to continue to be a teacher and with the vision knowing that I I want to help a lot of people right and I, I do really want to help change people's lives um, on a bigger scale as well I think that if I don't consistently day in and day out do the internal work that's necessary to be able to show up as a leader um, for the people who might need to hear the message, then, you know, that's, that's doing a disservice to them and, and doing a disservice to myself as well. So I think I have a big commitment to consistently doing the work every single day so that I can show up for them a lot better. Awesome. Uh, for me, this is a, a hard ask, so I don't know how you're going to answer this, but where do you see yourself in five years? Yeah, no, you're good. You're good. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So I'll just answer truthfully. I have absolutely no idea. I have absolutely no idea. And I, I genuinely don't believe in the whole five-year rule, and here's why. Um, a lot of the time, like, you know, I'll say, I used to do this. I used to have a six month plan, a one year plan, a five year plan, a 10 year plan. And then I started seeing how life really pans out. You know, I started seeing how life can change so fast, how mm. one thing can happen that can trigger a cascade of events, or maybe one person comes into your life that triggers a cascade of events or opportunities or all of these things. And I think what I've learned as a result of that um, is to be open. And to be open to opportunity, to be open to change, to be open to meeting people um, in, in all sorts of ways. And that in itself, to choose to live in the unknown every day has brought about more opportunity than any kind of planning ever has for me. So although I have a general idea of my goals, my desires, my ambitions, and how I want to grow, I want to spend, honestly, the rest of my life being open and in the unknown just to an extent. How do you, I, and I relate to those comments. So it's, um, and I, I just imagine like a whole entire portion of our audience going, ah, like the engineers or the, you know, the, the systems <laughs> yeah, people yeah. going, oh my God, that just, you know, it's a scary concept. So how do, how do you personally reconcile the difference between sort of open, you know, um, opportunity and planning and system structure. What do you think? 
Yeah, so I think there is definitely a fine line between the two. Um, I think there is a fine line between, you know, completely living in the unknown and then obviously having some level of structure, some level of yes. change that is going to be important. And so I think, I, I want to address this first because you mentioned the engineers. And so <laughs> when it comes to that, I, I totally get it because, you know, I was actually personally like a control freak. I wanted everything determined. I wanted everything with a level of certainty. And honestly, a lot of times when our students initially onboard, they'll ask questions and rightfully so of like, can you guarantee this? If I do this, will right. this happen, right? Because we like our human nature, our desire, like whether you're an engineer, a lawyer, a doctor, um, you know, a receptionist, whatever you are, we want some level of certainty. And so what we do as a result of that is we create this false sense of certainty. Ah. At the end of the day, all of us to, to the degree that we allow, we, we are we're living in the unknown and so whether we want to tell us ourselves a story that there is certainty that you know our life is mapped out to some extent you know we we really don't have that certainty and that in a sense is a false sense now there is a difference between me putting myself in a position where i say yeah maybe i'll be in argentina in two months versus like well i have this amount of time planned and so I right. do want to draw that discrepancy. And so I think that at the end of the day, it's, there's hmm. a few things that are important. And you have to find out what are my values? What do I hold to highest degree? And what do I want with these? What kind of results do I want to create with these? And map out those enough to the extent that you have a direction that you want to go in and allow for opportunity. Because what I notice happens a lot of the time is sometimes we'll be so rigid in, in our plan, in our goal, in what we want to create, that that tunnel vision disallows mm. potential opportunity yes. to really change our lives. So yes. I think if we mix the both, we'll be able to get a lot, of it more, a lot more results yeah. out of it. But I think it's really interesting, uh, you know, in this particular, in this day and age and going forward, the, the, the fine balance between uh staying open to opportunities and and planning right there has to be a, a magic sort of comfort level in there what do you think sarah <laughs> yeah yeah um i would say that at the end of the day have an idea of where you want to go have an idea of your vision be clear on that vision be clear on the goal and go for it 100 percent. and if an opportunity comes your way I want you, instead of cutting it off and focusing 100% on the plan that you already have, I want you to just take a minute, take a second, reflect on that opportunity and ask if it serves the ultimate goal that you have. And if it can potentially help you, and if it can potentially lead you in a direction that will serve and in, in ways be able to partner with the goal that you have, then go for that all in. Because that way you have some level of certainty, regardless of what that means, and you are staying open enough to opportunity that can help grow whatever that looks like for you. I know there's a, you just use the words being all in. Uh, and I just want to touch on that because the, the definition of all in, I think for me is, is just being so confident and certain that that regardless of whether it works out perfectly or not, you, you can be attached to this behavior, this action, because it is aligned to your goals. And um, I, I just, I've had some people, you know, talk about being all in. What does that mean? It means different things to different people. But, um, you know, for you, it clearly, you know, resonates with the idea that whatever you're doing, put your energy behind it, put your commitment behind it, and then boom, it, it will lead you towards your goals. Would you agree? Yeah, and I, and I, and I want to add is that th this is the thing that I've noticed about business. And so sometimes I wonder, you know, what is the difference between the people who, who end up, you know, making it or are successful in business versus the people who aren't? Because I remember the first time I started becoming successful in business, I looked to my dad and I was genuinely confused. And I said, dad, why is it 
everyone in business? Why isn't everyone doing this? Like, what? And I, I just really didn't, I really didn't grasp that idea. And I think that a lot of the times, you know, we'll say we're all in and we mean it when we say it. Like when we say, you know, we're committed, I want to do this, um, we're committed, but business isn't easy. Business isn't easy. And you're, you're, you have to face not only so many things from, from the entrepreneurial perspective, but with your, with yourself, you have to look at yourself in the mirror. There's no boss guiding you. There's nobody telling you what to do. There's nobody really there to, to guide or lead. You are now the leader. And as a result of that, you need to do your own introspection. You need to look in the mirror Mm -hmm. sometimes faster than you ever have before. And so if you're not willing or potentially too scared to do that consistently day in and day out, um, then unfortunately a lot of people do end up giving up. And so I think the idea for me personally was I couldn't imagine that the thought of going back to a a nine to five was (laughs) something that was like, it didn't even exist. The thought could not exist. It didn't matter. It was like, okay, so as long, it doesn't matter how many times I fail because the number of times I fail means that I'm that much closer to success. And I've noticed that mindset among every student. So they'll say things like, yeah, you know, I, I got on four sales calls and they all said no, but that makes me so happy because it tells me that the sixth one is going to say yes. And I'm that much closer to that next one. Awesome. So I, uh, I, I'm going to share with you post-podcast something that you just totally in like got fired up for me personally, but that's a different conversation. I'm excited. Um, but yeah, uh, one is I'm probably not going to bump into you anytime in person soon being yeah. on different continents at the moment, but I would like, to, I would love to connect with you again in person or yeah. sorry, online at some point. I'll be so in you're, your friends. You're officially part of the Canada's podcast network. So welcome to the alumni. I do. <laughs> how, how can people get a hold of you post podcast, Sarah? Yes. So a um, few things. So they can either follow me on Instagram at Safari Sarah. So that's S-A-F-F-A-R-I, uh, S-A-R-A-H. Or they can check out our website at the theceoownedcoach.com. Awesome. Sarah, thank you for your time. I'm so glad that we had a little snippet of Canada Day celebrations yes. together. And uh, stay safe and healthy in Colombia. Thank you for having me. This podcast is sponsored by eBay Canada. eBay Canada is here to help. They've been supporting Canadian small business retailers for 25 years and have recently launched their up and running program to meet an urgent need to get business online today. New business sellers can get a free e-commerce store for 90 days when they visit ebay.ca slash up and running.